Hello everyone, welcome to the Iron Dice. You are about to listen to part 5 of our series about early Weimar Germany. As always, if you haven't listened to the previous shows, that shouldn't be a problem, although it does enhance the experience. And without any further ado, part 5 of The Fight for the Republic. We are determined that the vicious German cycle of war, pony peace, shall once and for all time come to an end. This is London Court. Here is a news flash. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. Early this morning, the Soviet troops launched a general attack on Hungary. Those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. Tonight I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Not I. Say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. Over a million people here celebrating a day that they never thought would come. A day in which Germany became one country again. Launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. If the iron dice must roll, may God help us. Quote, Hope you got your things together. Hope you are quite prepared to die. Looks like we're in for nasty weather. One eye is taken for an eye. Credence Clearwater Revival. Bad Moon Rising. The world is a dead star. It doesn't warm anymore. Vicky Baum, Grand Hotel. The date is December 16th, 1918. It's the day the fate of the German Revolution will be decided. In front of the Prussian parliament in Berlin, thousands of people have gathered to hear Karl Liebknecht, the leading figure of the revolutionaries, speak. And as the representatives inside the Prussian parliament take their seats to decide on Germany's future, Liebknecht whips up the crowd and says that this is the hour of the final battle between the workers and capital. The stage for this battle is the big hall inside the Prussian parliament that on this cold December morning is packed with people. Everyone from the most powerful actors inside German politics to delegates representing councils from the backwoods of Bavaria are there to speak on behalf of their constituents. And among the people attending, while they might consider themselves political enemies, there is still a sense of optimism. The belief that the questions of the day can be resolved through good faith dialogue and the democratic process. Little do they know that only a week from now, this optimism will get crushed as the country descends into violence. The meeting we're looking at here is called the Reichskanzel Congress. And it's not your typical get-together of politicians talking over some stuff, no. In this hall, those present will form the basis of a new country almost. The two opposing forces, as so often until now, are the moderate social democrats and the far left, represented by the independents and other groups. If you have been following our story, you know that the far left, up until this point, has basically lost every battle for institutional power in the wake of the revolution. That's not to say they're defeated though, because this Congress has the potential to turn the tide in their favor since now it's the workers' turn to decide. The delegates making up this Congress represent the councils of workers and soldiers that sprung up during and after the revolution in November. The most radical among the far left coalition is a group led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg called the Spartacists. And what the Spartacists and their comrades want is for these councils to form the basis of a new socialist Germany, one that is controlled by the workers through the structure of the councils. As the chatter in the Great Hall quiets down, a middle-aged man in a suit nudges up his glasses and is ready to hold his opening speech. This guy, who goes by the name of Richard Müller, is not a moderate. The group he belongs to are called the revolutionary stewards, who are a bunch of union representatives that broke away from the bigger unions over the issue of the war. 
because no matter how bad things got, during wartime, the bigger unions would not call for a strike out of a perceived patriotic duty. So these stewards said, screw this, and organized for better working conditions and an end to the war. And in his opening speech, you can hear this guy wants the revolution to continue. He says, here in this hall, here in this place, where the strongest supporters of the old guilt-laden overthrown regime once met, the representatives of the workers and soldiers councils of Germany meet today to lay the foundations of the German Socialist Republic. Here in this hall, where the most brutal domineering men tried and often succeeded to put the German people in chains, here in this place of sharpest reaction, you shall now secure the achievements of the revolution, firmly enshrine the political power of the workers and soldiers, and show the German working people the way to freedom, happiness, and prosperity. The other speech that opens this Congress is held by Friedrich Ebert, who represents the Social Democrats, and he wants to put the brakes on current developments. His tenor is basically let's not rush things and focus on setting up democratic institutions that will then take care of all major changes. A ton of stuff is fought over during this Congress, but in terms of what really matters, there are three questions at hand. The first one of those is forced when a bunch of soldiers storm the building and demand the Congress to put the soldiers' councils in charge of the military. This gets put to a vote the next day, and this is the first showdown between moderates and radicals. Because if you remember, for Ebert and his crew, the military in its current form is the trump card they can pull out if the situation in Germany goes south. They want, they need to hold on to their secret pact with the military. The other side knows that if there is going to be a counter-revolution, it is going to come from the military, the former German deep state. And you really see this attitude towards the military as the enemy in the text of this motion. One point goes, as a symbol of the smashing of militarism and the abolition of zombie-like obedience, the removal of all insignia of rank and a ban on carrying weapons off duty are ordered. If you would have shown this text to anyone prior to the revolution, they would have believed you're insane. Germany is the military. Prussian militarism is in our DNA. Some people would have liked others to believe. And when it's time to vote on this the next day, the moderates suffer their first defeat. The Congress votes in favor of the motion. This includes putting the military under civilian control as well as soldiers voting on their officers and, quote, abolishing the standing army and establishment of a people's army. Just smashing the military hierarchy and throwing it to the winds. The next big fight is on the issue of the economy. A big chunk of the workers call for socialization of key industries, making them collectively owned, basically. The establishment around Ebert again argues against this. The challenge of transforming the German economy away from its current state, which is a war economy, is already a huge challenge. And if we add another thing on top, we're just going to blow this to pieces. In theory, they are not against this, they claim, but we should not do it right now. The other side, shouting at the moderates, say that doing it now is the only way to really secure economic change for the revolution and anything else is a huge risk. On the third day of the Congress, it votes in favor of socializing the key German industries. And not just that, but to do it immediately. No delay, no committee to assess the impact of every policy. No, has to start right now. So now the moderates are down two to zero on the big questions. You might wonder, how is that possible since the Social Democrats have much more influence than the independents and a majority of those attending the Congress are part of the Social Democratic Party? What separates them from the party higher ups is that they make up the party base. Their positions are a lot closer to that of the independents than Ebert's, for instance, and the influence the party leadership has on them is limited. Now it gets to the big one. This vote is not about the economy or military affairs, but who gets to wield the ultimate power in Germany. The moderates want to call a national assembly, which will then set up a parliamentary democracy. The radicals want a council republic. In the latter, the councils that now already exist and are represented at this Congress would vote on any given issue. And this gives 
the maximum amount of control to the workers and soldiers that make up those councils. One big difference here is that while a representative in a parliamentary system is only bound by their conscience to do what they say they're going to do, in this council system, if a council decides on an issue, their representative has to do it. They have to act how their council votes. It's a system of pure democracy. On this last issue of the Congress, the radicals have reason to be optimistic because, remember, it's the councils that get to decide here. This council system already exists. So for the moderates to win on this, the members of this Congress would have to remove themselves from the levels of power. And who would do that, right? Well, when the moment of truth comes, the members decide against the council system by a margin of 400 to 50. And with that, the last ditch effort of the revolutionaries to secure institutional power has failed. It shatters the hopes of Liebknecht and others that, despite their previous defeats, they could still come out on top somehow. Richard Müller, the person who opened this congress, summarizes it like this. This congress was the first revolutionary tribunal in Germany, but there was no sign of revolutionary spirit. I didn't set my expectations too high beforehand, but still I could not believe that this congress would turn into a political suicide club. The reason for why these councils decide to slit their own throat in a political sense is twofold. While these representatives are voted in by the workers and soldiers, most of them have already been active within the existing union structures. So there is a bias there in favor of these social democrats and the systems that already exist when we get past issues like the economy or the military. Secondly, if they had voted for this, they would have been on the hook, preventing famine, restructuring the economy, the electrical grid, running the entire country, everything would have been their responsibility. Many of them were simply scared off by this. And when the social democrats said, come on guys, we have this interim government and when we hold elections, we can do all this stuff in an orderly fashion, they believed that. And because of this, because the radicals are not able to secure a new power structure in these councils, their previous victories will ultimately become meaningless. The government that will come out of this National Assembly will drag their feet on these things and in many cases won't implement them at all. Like smashing the military structure. That won't happen. And that will prove a fateful error for the Social Democrats later in our story. What is fascinating to see here is... As the revolutionaries suffer another blow, the fear of them just keeps ramping up further and further. Those people already shaking in their boots about Liebknecht, Luxembourg and the people around them become increasingly convinced that a Bolshevik takeover is imminent. In parts, this is due to the aggressive rhetoric of the Spartacists themselves. On the other hand, the press and the right in the country are just pushing these fears to the extreme. One day before Christmas, a very influential newspaper in the country summarized these fears in a big article. Among other things, they claim that over 100,000 unemployed are roaming the streets of Berlin and calls these people the scum of humanity. And given this, even the Social Democrats are allegedly realizing that under Liebknecht and Luxembourg, the revolution has become a revolution of the mob. All hysteria aside, when Liebknecht said the final battle between the workers and capital is imminent, he wasn't completely wrong. It might not have been this Congress, but Berlin is about to witness a battle of unprecedented scale. At this point in our story, if you listen to our previous episodes, you might have come across moments where you might have asked yourself, when is this going to come to blows? Be it the rift weakening the left or the right wing that is just frothing at the mouth to take out their anger on their enemies. How long can this last? The hatred, the fear, the hysteria. It reaches its breaking point on Christmas Eve, 1918. From that point onwards known as Blutweihnachten or Bloody Christmas. A couple of weeks prior, a conflict had started to build up between the city administration in Berlin and a number of sailors that had seized the Berlin Palace during the revolution in November. Throughout the next month, these guys just stayed at this palace waiting to receive their salary from the government, and if they weren't going to get it, they weren't going to leave the place. Now, the city commander, a guy named Otto Welz, who you might remember from previous episodes, sees these guys as a threat because he thinks they're in cahoots with the Spartacists. Instead of paying them their wages, he accuses them of stealing from the palace and demands they disband and leave the place at once. 
negotiations between the two sides don't lead to anything. And when a skirmish between sailors and soldiers loyal to the government kills two people, the sailors decide to take the city commander Otto Wels hostage and drag him to the palace. And not just that, but in addition, they position guards in and around the palace and set up machine gun nests on the balconies. On its face, this might not seem like a fateful event, given how much is happening in the country, but if we see the vortex of violence that Germany is about to experience as a row of dominoes, the kidnapping of Otto Wels is the first domino to fall. Now that this guy has been kidnapped, the clock is ticking. Even more so after it makes the rounds that the sailors are torturing the guy. With the city commander out of the picture, the decision on what to do falls on the leading figure of the Social Democrats, Friedrich Ebert. First thing he does is call Berlin's police commissioner and request his men to storm the palace and free the city commander to save his life. But when approached with this order, Berlin's police commissioner says no. Because this guy is not a Social Democrat. He belongs to the independents and didn't like Ebert a whole lot. In fact, he is more sympathetic to the side of the sailors. And now Friedrich Ebert is faced with a choice. Do you try to find someone else who is willing to free Otto Wels, who is Ebert's colleague and friend, I should say, or does he pick the nuclear option? An option that the Social Democrats had been pushed to pick previously, but always negated because they were afraid of unleashing something that they couldn't control. That option is requesting support from the old powers, making use of their secret pact and enlisting the front soldiers who recently got back from the war. Men of whom a lot are simply consumed by hatred. Hate for themselves, hate for the world that had given them this lot, and above all, hate for the left. The left that had stabbed them in the back and robbed them of certain victory in the war. The left that had all their sacrifices be for nothing in their minds. There was a very influential book that came out in the early 30s called The Outlaws, written by a member of these Freikorp units, these volunteer units, that will see a lot of action in our story moving forward. And this book is a great insight into the mind of these guys and how they see themselves. Here's an excerpt from The Outlaws describing these Freikorps units active in the Baltic. We made our last push. We roused ourselves once more and charged. To the last man, we left our cover and dashed into the wood. We ran across the snowfields and broke into the forest. We took them unawares and raged and shot and killed. We hunted the lads across the fields like hares, set fire to every house, smashed every bridge to smithereens, and broke every telegraph pole. We dropped the corpses into the wells and threw grenades after them. We killed anything that fell into our hands. We set fire to everything that would burn. We saw red. We lost every feeling of humanity. Where we had ravaged, the earth groaned under the destruction. Where we had charged, dust, ashes, and charred books lay in place of houses like festering wounds in the open country. A great banner of smoke marked our passage. We had kindled a fire, and in it was burning all that was left of our hopes, longings, ideals, values, and laws of the old world. This is who Friedrich Ebert can use to restore order in the capital. And he does it. In the late evening, he calls the military high command and tells its leaders that it's time to restore order in Berlin by military means. The high command at this stage had been desperate for this call, just waiting for a reason, any reason, to use their weapons of war against the revolutionaries. Now it is time for them to make an example out of these sailors. The general they tasked with this previously took part in the genocide of the indigenous Herero and Nama in the German colonies, so you can be sure this guy doesn't mess around. And in the early hours of December 24th, in the dark of night, he and over a thousand of his men get ready to strike. While the regular citizens are getting ready for Christmas, wrapping gifts, preparing food, this unit is about to finally get their revenge. If you had the police or any other unit tasked with something like this today, you would probably see tear gas or other non-lethal weapons used at first. Not so with these guys. They load up machine guns, mortars, pack grenades. In their belts, they're carrying hatchets to bury in the sailors' heads should they get close. 
it's obvious this is going to get very ugly. One of the reasons for that is that these guys are not here to do the bidding of the government out of any kind of loyalty. They are here to crack some skulls. And you can just imagine the atmosphere on the back of the truck as they are loading their rifles, double checking their equipment. They must have been shaking with excitement to finally get this chance. After all, they are real veterans, while the other side, what do they bring to the table? A group of ragtag sailors? This is open season for them. Shortly before the dawn, the soldiers get out of their trucks, surround the palace, and set up artillery, taking dead aim at windows and balconies. The commanding general sets an ultimatum for the sailors to come out and surrender, otherwise they will face the consequences. And 10 minutes later, the artillery thunders, ripping huge holes into the building's facade. They have no concern for killing Otto Welz during the attack. This is about vengeance and nothing else. The balcony on which the Kaiser held the speech, announcing Germany going to war in 1914, and on which Karl Liebknecht called on the proletariat to complete the world revolution a month ago, gets pulverized. And as the general blows his whistle, the soldiers leave from their cover and storm the palace. But contrary to all expectations, this ragtag group of revolutionaries fight back vigorously. Their machine gun rips holes into the enemy's formation. At one point, the soldiers are able to push into the palace through a giant hole, but quickly get beaten back. And then, during the battle, the sailors suddenly get reinforcements as the police commissioner sends his men to aid them. Workers witnessing the battle jump the barricades and start freeing captives and haranguing officers. What the military expected to be basically shooting fish in a barrel, quickly turns into an utter disaster for them. By noon, over 50 soldiers are dead and the military is forced to halt the attack. Friedrich Ebert, hearing that the trick he had up his sleeve just got crushed at the palace, calls off the attack. He has no other option now than to negotiate and the whole thing ends with the sailors releasing Otto Welz, receiving their outstanding salary and leaving the palace. It's hard to understate how humiliating this is, not just for Friedrich Ebert, but especially for the military. Remember, these guys have convinced themselves that despite Germany's defeat, they did what they could and aren't at fault. Hell, when they entered the city only a few days ago, Friedrich Ebert told them in a public speech in an effort to win them over, no enemy was able to overcome you. These people have at least tried to completely delude themselves. One member of the military who goes by the name of Waldemar Papst, who will become an important character later on, describes this moment of the sailors triumphing over the soldiers as the most harrowing experience of their military life for those part of the proudest Prussian regiments. The general leading the assault on the palace will later try to explain what happened in an interview and he blames the civilians. He says that during a short ceasefire, his men were swarmed by men, women and children and since his honorable men would never fire at women and children, they were forced to retreat. This explanation enrages the right and those who feel threatened by Liebknecht and his following. Not because they don't believe the general, but because they see him as weak for his humanitarian concerns of not shooting at women and children. They believe that if you're not vicious enough, the revolutionaries have already won. And this defeat really throws the right into a mental crisis and plunges them further into this frenzy they're in. The general who screwed up the attack gets sacked and the men who replace him, one of whom they just mentioned, Waldemar Papst, will make sure something like this will never happen again. One of the measures they take is to establish a guideline that says if you encounter a hostile group of civilians, you are to open fire immediately. Not only does the sailors' victory at Berlin Palace spook the far right, but also large sectors of the press. During this time, newspapers are critical to shaping the mood in the country and they do so overwhelmingly against the Spartacists. On Christmas Eve, one of the traditionally liberal newspapers in the country that has been screaming from the rooftops about anarchy in Berlin prophesies that without a, quote, forceful decision, 
catastrophe is imminent. A contemporary historian, Gustav Meyer, agrees and writes in his diary on the 25th of December, we're facing the edge of the abyss. The maw of hell has opened. Germany is sinking. If the rest of Europe will survive, today who can predict it? The events of yesterday leave me entirely despondent. As you can see, when I say mental crisis, it's not an overstatement. These people are convinced Liebknecht is about to take over. So much so that officers in the military ask the higher ups to release them and their men from service so they can go home and protect their families. They are scared to death of the left. You can also see how you can also see how shook the social democrats are by the recent events in a couple of articles in the party newspaper forward. One article released in the aftermath of the battle at Berlin Palace says that Germany has reached a critical juncture where the choice is either a rule of the people or the rule of criminals, and describes the sailors as aiming to establish an Asiatic tyranny of hunger and terror like in Russia. The article ends with an explicit call to arms when it says, Out there, the soldiers paid with blood so that they could return to find a free fatherland. They did not make these sacrifices to return to a country in which everything sinks in blood, dirt, hunger, in which madness and despotism rule. Yes, we, those of us who were soldiers, who were out there lying in filth and muck, with death in front of our eyes. While we were there, we dreamed of a better future for our nation. We must now remain firmly united and must be clear about what is at stake. We cannot tolerate mutiny and rebellion against the authorities of our republic. No one who preaches or demands rebellion can be seen as an honest comrade. We must stand with our people and protect the republic so that it does not end up under the tyranny of a criminal minority. What is so bizarre about this political moment in German history is that this level of anxiety is simply not rooted in reality. It's almost comical how much the fear of the left and the amount of power it actually wields differ. For instance, the sailors at Berlin Palace weren't even Spartacists for the most part. They had been social democrats. Not to mention that Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg had absolutely nothing to do with their activities. But in this moment where Everybody is so anxious of the demon of the revolution Liebknecht and the blood dripping Rosa as they are called in the press. None of that matters. When the news gets around that the government was forced to reach an agreement with the sailors, this gets spun into a total capitulation to radical forces in Berlin. Now those already scared are just waiting for the hammer to drop. For the moment, Liebknecht and his secret army of over a hundred thousand men will emerge from the shadows. During a Christmas service in the Berlin Cathedral, a mass panic breaks loose when some attendees believe a group of Spartacists had infiltrated the cathedral. People start screaming, grabbing their children and stumble out of the building. No Spartacists were found anywhere near the cathedral that day. On December 27th, even more fuel is added to the fire when one newspaper opens with the headline in big, bold print, Liebknecht rules alleging the Spartacists had taken power in the capital. In reality, though, it's not the Spartacists who are about to take almost complete control in Berlin. Right up until now, the power has been shared in the so-called Council of People's Deputies. Half Social Democrats, half Independents. But this fragile alliance gets put to the test when the Independents find out what Ebert and his Social Democratic colleagues on the Council have done. Because not only did the Social Democrats call upon the military to conduct an operation within the capital using war machinery against German citizens, they did so without informing the rest of the interim government before or after the fact. The independents sitting on the council are enraged by this. They say, how can you do this? Why not invite the Kaiser back in if you're just going to rely on the old powers anyway? To them, it increasingly looks like all this talk about the unity of the working class and governing together, that's really just the velvet glove over the iron fist. And of course, Ebert and his colleagues say that they didn't have a choice and only made the call after learning that the sailors were torturing their party colleague. At the end of a lot of heated debate, the independents decide that they simply cannot accept this and on December 28th, half the council resigns, severing the last tie that held the labor movement together since the start of the revolution and allowing the social democrats to make a clean sweep. They immediately replace the independents with other social democrats so that now the council is under complete social democratic control. In addition to this, these guys have 
radicalized to a large degree over the course of the last month, apart from immense pressure from liberal and conservative forces to finally extinguish the Spartacist threat, a number of people take to the streets in late December and demand a more forceful course of action from the government. And these aren't small demonstrations. On December 29th, tens of thousands take to the streets with shouts like, down with the Bolshevists, down with Spartacists, holding up signs that read, Germany doesn't want to be Russia. And of course, there are also thousands of people in the streets supporting the revolutionaries, calling for an end to the Ebert dictatorship and solidarity with Russia. On December 30th, Berlin's biggest newspaper writes, the air is charged with electricity. Unparalleled political tension. The soul in Berlin is glowing. Now we will see the Social Democrats definitively take off what historian Mark Jones calls the mask of political moderation. They are not the only ones going new ways, though. In this electrically charged atmosphere, a new political force emerges. One day before New Year's Eve, hundreds of radicals, revolutionaries and Spartacists get together to unite under a single banner. People like Rosa Luxemburg had, up until the last moment, argued that they would be better off using the independence to carry the propaganda into the masses, as she says. But with the defeat of the independence at the Council Congress in mid-December, she too comes around to the need for something new. The attendees at this meeting are completely disillusioned with the Social Democrats' call for a unity among the workers because that only ever meant unity on their terms. The reformism of the independence has also proven impotent to bring about meaningful change. Now it's time to take power on their own terms. This new movement will not be a minor leftist splinter group, but will grow to roughly 400,000 card-carrying members. At the beginning, it's a broad mix of all kinds of different groups, but those dominating the movement will be the young, hungry revolutionaries, not the old theorists. One attendee notes that the rest of the people there almost felt powerless against the, quote, spirit of fanatical utopianism. This group, on the 30th December 1918, forms the Communist Party of Germany, the KPD. They want to overthrow the interim government and achieve the second German revolution. Before they can get there, though, there are questions of the day that are immediate cause for heated debate. Like, will we take part in the National Assembly and become a part of the German parliament? Those arguing that they should, like Rosa, are booed, while those in favor of boycotting the assembly, calling for immediate action, are elevated by the crowd. And at this point, Rosa, for instance, is somewhat skeptical of the direction of this movement. To people close to her, she tells that she feels like they have a too narrow perspective. And when the other members decide in favor of boycotting the assembly, she calls it an outgrowth of a childish, immature radicalism. To her, the masses simply aren't ready for the revolution yet and toppling the government won't achieve what the communists are hoping for. This perspective of hers is about to change. In early January 1919, the Social Democrats are almost in complete control. And just take a moment to contemplate just how well these guys played their cards. A revolution happens that they don't want, that they fight against, in fact, but when they sense that they can stop it anymore, they position themselves at the front and take over most institutions coming from this. They have the unions and a large portion of the workers, they have the council of people's deputies, they have the military on their side and are most likely going to become the biggest party in the upcoming elections at the National Assembly. Still, there is one critical holdout left that is a thorn in their side the Berlin police commissioner. Not only has this guy defied their orders to attack the sailors on Bloody Christmas and instead help them fight the military, he is open about his sympathy for the Spartacists. So after seizing control of the Council of People's Deputies, they tell this guy to take a hike. This police commissioner is no desk jockey though. His response is basically, listen, I don't know who you think you are, that you have the power to make me resign, but I was given this position by the revolution and only the revolution can take it away from me. 
When the new police commissioner shows up at the department, he is driven off by soldiers and armed workers loyal to the old commissioner. They won't allow the counter-reaction to seize the last institution from them. And at this point, even if you don't know that much about Weimar history, you just know this is about to go south. The tension in the city has been going up and up and up, and you're constantly wondering what is going to be the release valve for all of this. For the Social Democrats and the Freikorps who want to stomp out the threat from the left, and for the radicals to finally finish the revolution. On January 5th, 1919, the independents and their allies organize a protest march in support of the police commissioner. And in itself, this is nothing special. These kinds of marches have been happening all throughout December from all sides. The dynamic of this march changes when the independents contact the Spartacists, or communists now rather, and request their support. On the same day, they put up posters all throughout Berlin and especially around the factories and publish a call to action for every worker. Not only is this published in the communist newspaper, The Red Flag, but also in the paper of the independents called Freedom. In their grab for power, the social democrats have united the splintered far left and created themselves a powerful enemy. The articles and posters say that the ousting of the commissioner is what Liebknecht had been warning about for weeks now, the eradication of every achievement made during the revolution. Remember when Liebknecht warned that the counter-revolution is already on the march a month ago? This is it. This will be the final strike at the heart of the revolution, and the police will once again be a tool of the ruling class to oppress the workers. And if you're a worker in Berlin, you remember what that was like. You remember the batons and the police breaking up your strikes during the war when all you wanted was better working conditions. This call to action really pushes at those buttons of the average factory worker who got politicized during the war. What you see after is a massive amount of people not seen since the revolution in November taking to the streets of Berlin. Together, they march to the police station and more and more people join. Even groups that just happen to also protest on the same day. They all unite under the red flag in an opposition to a return to the pre-revolution status quo. At the police station, Liebknecht and others give speeches, whipping up the crowd, that they have to be prepared to choke off any attempt at counter-revolution. And everyone realizes this is not an ordinary protest march. The newspaper The Red Flag proudly claims that this is the most powerful contingent the proletariat of Berlin was able to pull together so far. And in this case, they're right. Liebknecht renews his call to topple the government and says that the workers have to be ready to smash the National Assembly with violent means if necessary. You probably won't be shocked to find out that in this atmosphere, as soon as it gets dark in Berlin, this protest march takes on a new dimension. And here I have to be careful about what I say because you see this with protests today too where things are largely peaceful and then a small subset of people take things into a different direction. They escalate, they do things that are obviously counterproductive and provoke a reaction from the authorities. Often this is just what happens when a large group of people get together. Some people take it too far. But it also happens that these people are doing this deliberately because they secretly work for the other side. Agent provocateur is what they're called. And you have to be cautious with accusations like this as to not get into conspiracy territory, but they do exist. There is a broad historical record of this tactic being used by the police to break up labor strikes or the FBI to infiltrate the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War. In our story, the historical record shows that the police and other groups also have secret agents within the labor movement and the communists. It's one thing to say, what is harder to figure out is what actions are down to their presence and what has to be chalked up to things merely getting out of control. Be that as it may, during this protest, a smaller group of roughly 600 people splits off and heads for Berlin's newspaper district. Armed and ready to take action, this group storms the printing plants of the social democratic newspaper Forward that had been demonizing the Spartacists for weeks now. Now, this building is not wholly undefended, about 
80 soldiers armed with multiple machine guns are supposed to provide protection, but decide not to put up a fight against the belligerent crowd. Besides storming the forward building, the group also takes control of a number of publishing houses and throws the freshly printed pro-government posters out onto the street and sets them on fire. While all of this is happening, the people who called for this protest are overwhelmed by the moment. Never would they have imagined that a crowd this huge would show up and now they're facing an important crossroad on what to do. Do we use this energy somehow or would it be better to further organize and wait? That evening, representatives of the KPD, the independents and the revolutionary stewards gather at the Berlin police station to decide on what to do now. As they're discussing the possibilities in getting all these messages that the newspaper district has been seized by revolutionaries and all that stuff, they kind of get high on their own supply. In other words, recent events have convinced them that not only the masses are on their side, but that the soldiers garrisoned in the city will flock to the protests as well. They get caught up in a sort of revolutionary euphoria and are convinced now's the time to strike. It's all or nothing now. After a brief discussion, they overwhelmingly vote in favor of calling for a general strike with the aim of toppling the social democrats and putting themselves into power. How they're going to accomplish this is not clear at this moment and there are people among the left who are skeptical of this approach but nobody wants to be less radical than the person next to them. Even the guy who functions as the connection to Moscow advises against this. Rosa Luxemburg, who is not at this meeting at the police station, also had doubts about this, but as she witnesses this massive amount of people taken to the streets, she too is convinced that they have to act. The next day, they publish a new proclamation calling on the workers to secure and finish the revolution. It says, onwards to the fight for socialism, onwards to the fight for the power of the revolutionary proletariat. What started as a protest about a change in personnel basically, is about to turn into the January Uprising. Spartacist Uprising is another term, but that's really a misnomer because, as you can see, it wasn't the Spartacists that started the initial protest, nor are they the biggest group present. On January 6th, Berlin witnesses not one, but two massive protests, and even more people take to the streets than the day before. One group is there to secure the achievements of the revolution, whatever that means to them, and the other group are the pro-government people that the Social Democrats had called to protest against the Spartacist acts of violence. This is the moment where there is a real opening for the communists. They're armed, they're motivated, there is chaos in the streets, and in this climate, it's not impossible to take the chancellery, for instance. Not that this wouldn't result in a bloody battle, but you know, that's, that's kind of what you're signing up for if you want to topple the government. Where the two protests meet, occasional clashes break out that leave several people dead, the city is clearly at a tipping point. Yet, the support of the soldiers that the communists were sure they were going to get doesn't materialize. Even the sailors of the People's Navy, even the guys the government sent soldiers to fight against not even two weeks ago, declare themselves neutral. Still, if there was ever a chance for the second revolution succeeding, this was it. But they squander that chance. It's too unorganized, too directionless. Our friend from earlier, Richard Müller, who is part of the committee formed at the police station, would later recall this moment like this. Had the Revolutionary Committee recognized the weakness of the government and wanted to overthrow it, it would have been possible on January 6th without much effort. But the committee was too preoccupied with its own weaknesses. It met to advise, discuss and advise. The masses stood in the Siegesallee and waited. Waited as they had waited the day before, went home disappointed today as they did yesterday. The next day... People still take to the streets, but in much smaller capacity, and it becomes clear that the majority of the workers is not as committed to ousting the government as the revolutionaries had assumed. The independents want to find an end to the conflict through dialogue and negotiation because the newspaper district remains occupied through all of this. 
the more radical forces among the left, like Rosa Luxemburg, who not that long ago was against any kind of action that wasn't supported by the majority of the workers, is now dead set against negotiating with the government. In an article for the Red Flag, she writes that the current government is a wall that has to be torn down. She scolds those wanting to negotiate with the, quote, mortal enemies. She even calls the independence a decaying corpse that poisoned the revolution. Ironically, the right in the country is also heavily against any kind of negotiation with the other side. A right-wing newspaper from Cologne writes, Now push comes to shove. Every compromise would merely be a new defeat of the Social Democrats and the definitive proof of their incompetence. This is one of the milder voices in the press, if you can believe it. A lot of liberal and conservative newspapers are now pretty much openly calling for violence. It's just a degree of how shrouded in metaphor it is. Calling on the government to finally get tough and stuff like that. Both sides get their wish. The negotiations between the revolutionaries and the government break down. And on January 8th, the Social Democrats flood Berlin with leaflets saying this. Spartacus is now fighting for total control. The government that wants the people to decide their own fate within 10 days is to be overthrown by force. Violence can only be fought with violence. The hour of reckoning is near. The hour of reckoning is near. Isn't that incredible? How this party that pre-1914 was committed to non-violence in unity among the workers has radicalized itself into what it is now. It's a great example of how in German society, employing violence, especially state violence, went from something that was hotly debated among liberals and leftists to the go-to tool to resolve political conflict in this era. In addition to that, the social democrats are simply fed up at this point. They don't want to deal with this anymore. And this aren't really even interested in finding a negotiated solution either. There's also the fear that if this instability keeps on persisting, the Entente might get involved and occupy the country to make sure there is no Bolshevik revolution. More so than anything else though, the Social Democrats want to punish the radicals. They want to put an end to this once and for all. A call goes out for volunteers to help end the Spartacist tyranny, and you can imagine the type of person that would volunteer for something like this. One day later, on January 9th, the KPD, the Independents and the Revolutionary Stewards release a joint statement calling on the people to pick up weapons against their mortal enemies, calling Ebert and the others Judases in the government and that they belong on the scaffold. The Independence newspaper Freedom, which had been calling for a peaceful solution right up until this point, writes, The government wants to go the path of violence. It wants the subjugation of the revolutionary workers. If yesterday we could still ask coming to an understanding or civil war, today it is no longer a question. The civil war is raging in the streets. The article concludes, The spirit and language of August 1914 are alive again. Only this time, it's not against the English, French or Russians, but against the revolutionary working class. What's incredible here is that While a number of people heed the call from the revolutionaries and the government, a huge mass of workers of Berlin gather in the streets against violence and for an end to the infighting and for those responsible to resign. Meaning not just Friedrich Ebert and leading social democrats, but also Liebknecht and his colleagues. It's too late though. The rift in the labor movement that opened up in August 1914 has become a chasm that cannot be crossed. Both sides are unable to get past their hatred for the other. Skirmishes start to break out all over Berlin, during which forces loyal to the government don't shy away from killing unarmed civilians in their hunt for the Spartacists. Another reason for why the Social Democrats are now this committed to stomping out the far left is that they believe Germany is now in the historical moment that Russia was in, only that they are determined to not let the Bolsheviks come out on top under any circumstance. And here's where a key player in all of this enters the scene again. A man by the name of Gustav Noske. He was the guy the Social Democrats sent to Kiel, the city in the north, at the start of the revolution to contain it as much as possible. And now he sits on the Council of People's Deputies as their military expert. 
For a couple of days now, this guy has been building up units in and around Berlin, just lying in wait. Here's an excerpt from his diary on those days. From the early morning of Tuesday, the house resembled an anthill. One bureau after another was set up. Crowds of volunteers came to be assigned to units. After three days, the area resembled a military base. One of the most active officers was Captain Pabst. That's Captain Waldemar Pabst, the successor of the general who messed up at the Battle of Berlin Palace. And on January 11th, he gets his chance when Gustav Noske orders the recapturing of the newspaper district. And this time, they are not going to be beaten back by a group of ragtag revolutionaries. This is where the Freikorps really come into their own and become a real part of the armed forces. One of these units, carrying the name Freikorps Potsdam, gets tasked with taking the building of the Social Democratic newspaper forward. And these guys are determined not just to fulfill their strategic goal here, but to exterminate their enemy. They show up with flamethrowers, with grenades, armored vehicles, and unleash a cavalcade of artillery on the building. Again, of course, the revolutionaries fight back here, but against this kind of firepower, they don't stand a chance. After merely three hours of active combat, the group inside the forward building wants to surrender. They start waving a white newspaper and several men exit the building with their hands raised above their heads. Together with two messengers that had tried to leave the building, these seven men get detained and dragged towards the nearby barracks. There won't be a negotiation, though. According to eyewitness accounts, the first of these men gets badly beaten by the Freikorps, who are screaming in his face, Russian pig, before smashing his face against a brick wall and putting a bullet in the back of his head. This is the end result of all those calls for the government to finally get tough, murdering an unarmed captive. According to this witness, the other men who wanted to surrender got led past this guy's body and insulted in a similar way. He then goes on to say that the first man was shot while standing up. Two or three men were shot while they were lying down and even hit by several bullets so that half of their faces were completely destroyed. A body lay to the right of the powder case. There was only a small part of his face left. Not a single man who wanted to negotiate a surrender with the Freikorps units survived. They all got executed that day and there was never even a trial for their murderers. Meanwhile, back at the forward building, those who have surrendered get lined up in front of the building. There are also some women there who had the job of taking care of the wounded inside the forward building. And one woman in particular catches the eye of the units there because they believe it's Rosa Luxemburg. As soon as she enters the row of captives, they start shouting, It's Rosa! It's Rosa that you have there! Punching and kicking her, ripping her clothes to pieces while calling her a Spartacist whore. This woman is not Rosa Luxemburg, but it is a testament to the ruthlessness of the men the Social Democrats have decided to ally with. This woman recounts it like this. I was pulled out. The soldiers took me and shoved me and hit me and once again. I was pulled up against the wall and straight away I noticed a group of soldiers moving back. I was amazed that a soldier was aiming his rifle at me. I said nothing because at that point I had completely frozen. The same time he put his gun down. They rushed around me and shouted, You see, gunpowder is too good for you. We will tear you open and share you so that each of us gets a piece of you. Luckily, at this point, an officer aware that this woman wasn't Rosa Luxemburg intervened and most likely prevented her from being lynched. Here you really see what one historian called the boundless hatred of the Freikorps unleashed. And this is only the beginning. Later that day, Gustav Noske, leading 3,000 soldiers, holds a victory parade through the city center. And this marks the definitive end of the January uprising. The newspaper of the Independence comments on their defeat in a very lengthy piece one day later like this. Great victory! The defeat of the Spartacists! These phrases ring out on the streets and in the squares of Berlin once again. The psychosis of the days of August 1914 appear to have reawoken. The nervous tension of the past weeks, the fear for property, 
the outrage about the disturbed peace and order, the continued threat of shooting and other military activities, all that vents itself in an especially repelling incitement of hatred against the revolutionary workers and soldiers who are now made into scapegoats for all the disasters of the previous days. The victory, paid for with hundreds of human lives, at the cost of the destruction of entire blocks of houses, the suspension of the entire life of the capital, the demoralization of large sections of the population, the destruction of the moral authority of the government among the masses of its own party supporters. Not only is the Forvets building a pile of rubble now, the mines and the grenades of the government soldiers have also destroyed the last bit of trust that part of the proletariat of Berlin had still retained in the leaders of the right-wing socialists. Most liberal and conservative newspapers support and even celebrate the use of excessive violence to restore peace and order in the capital, and why wouldn't they? This is what large swaths of the press had been calling for for weeks now. It's a natural outgrowth of this political culture in which the rhetoric gets more and more extreme. Rosa Luxemburg, who is now in hiding, also doesn't hold back in her piece in the red flag, titled Order Prevails in Berlin. And here you really see why the right wing hates her so much. She really puts her finger on the underlying insecurities of the Freikorps and others. Order prevails in Berlin. So prevails the bourgeois press triumphantly. So proclaim Ebert and Noske and the officers of the victorious troops who are being cheered by the petty bourgeois mob in Berlin, waving handkerchiefs and shouting, Hooray! The glory and honor of German arms have been vindicated before world history. Those who were routed in Flanders and the Argons have restored their reputation with a brilliant victory over 300 Spartacists in the Vorwärts building. The government's rampaging troops massacred the mediators who had tried to negotiate the surrender of the Vorwärts building, using their rifle butts to beat them beyond recognition. Prisoners who were lined up against the wall and butchered so violently that skull and brain tissue splattered everywhere. In the sight of glorious deeds such as those, who would remember the ignominious defeat at the hands of the French, British and Americans? Now Spartacus is the enemy. Berlin is the place where our officers can save a triumph and Noske, the worker, is the general who can lead victories where Ludendorff failed. Order prevails in Berlin. You foolish lackeys. Your order is built on sand. Tomorrow the revolution will rise up again, clashing its weapons. And to your horror, it will proclaim with trumpets blazing, I was, I am, I shall be. This is not the end though. Yes, order has been restored in Berlin for now, but the country is much bigger than that. Luxembourg and Liebknecht are still out there, hiding in the city. In the northern city of Bremen, revolutionaries have toppled the local government and called upon the federal government to resign. The state of Bavaria, right now called the People's State of Bavaria, is still in the hands of revolutionaries who took over in November. In the western Rhineland, more and more workers are appalled by the conduct of the social democrats and want to follow the example of Bremen and Bavaria, and they are not the only ones. Over the next few weeks, these republics will pop up all over the country, accompanied by a huge strike wave, with over a million workers taken to the streets just in Berlin. The social democrats are still far away from having control over the country, and we will soon find out how much further they are willing to go in their hour of reckoning.